Our new president had, of course, not been in this line of work before, and I think had excessive expectations about how quickly things happen in the democratic process. While that comment has really uh, set off a number of conservatives and particular supporters of President Trump. And we're going to talk about it here in the next few minutes. Washington Times columnist uh, Madison Jesiato is here. Former Bush 43 Special Assistant Ron Christie is here. And Caitlin Huey Burns from Real Clear Politics is also here. Why don't I go to you, Madison? Uh, number one, I know you've been a big supporter of the president. And a lot of people who are like you say, boy, excessive expectations? Really? They're upset about this, right? Right. It's absolutely ridiculous. We have to keep in mind why President Trump was elected. He was elected to drain the swamp to change Washington. You know, this is not a game of life or monopoly. This is the real world. There are real people out there every single day that are hurting because Congress is not, you know, making the changes that they need to make quickly enough. And so I think it's ridiculous and quite insulting to the American people. Hmm. There you go, Ron. So the, your Republican Party seems to be getting along quite well uh, these days. <laughs> what do you say? Well, I, good afternoon, Connell. I agree 100% with what Madison said. You know, I just remember back to 1994 when we were campaigning to take the House majority. We said, we have a contract with America. Right. If you give us the first 100 days, we're going to pass these 10 very important bills. You mean to tell me after seven years, after seven years of making promises to the American people that the Senate majority leader can't get his act together and bring legislation to the floor? I think it's a disgrace. And I say that as a proud Republican, but they've had their time, and I think the American voters are going to be the ones that well, are going to Well, that's the issue, revenge. right, Caitlin, is who takes the blame for all of this? That's how we're setting ourselves up for the midterms next year. Who to blame? Exactly. This is definitely a blame game. And these two parties, you would say, Trump uh, representing his own faction and the Republican Party represented by the majority leader, are were always kind of headed for this kind of collision course. You had a president now who campaigned on shaking up Washington, doing things mm -hmm. very quickly, and right. he would often say easily. Then you you have someone like Mitch McConnell, who is an institutionalist, a you get kind of the sense Republicans the are ready to turn their back on the president. I mean, in You're the Congress, a lot more of them. You're seeing active defiance on behalf of Republican lawmakers of this president. You're also seeing attention because they were always uh, this arranged marriage was always based on the agenda. Now that the agenda right. is in flux, uh, you're seeing this blame game go on. So there's a consequence to that, right, sure. Madison? So they do that, and, and part of you says, okay, well, the president's approval ratings are quite low. They're somewhere in the 30s. Well, guess what? Congress is a lot lower than that. Mm -hmm. So maybe it is the congressional Republicans that have more to, to lose here or more at risk than this president because they're all up for re-election or many of them are next year. Right. I'll tell you right now that the minute congressional Republicans turn their backs on the president is the minute that the American people will turn their backs even more on congressional Republicans. And where do they go? 2018's like what, they're, coming they're, primaries, you mean. This yes. will all be primaried. Yeah. I, I believe they will if they don't get their act together and get their act together very quickly. Like he said, we had seven years to come up with something to either repeal Obamacare or to repeal and replace Obamacare and they have absolutely nothing. We're a blank slate as we right. were seven and years ago. I've spent a lot of time talking to Republican lawmakers and strategists and, and you hear over and over again after the health care bill failure, you heard this concern and anxiety and frustration from Republicans about that the president isn't doing enough right. to help uh, make these negotiations happen. Someone that campaigned as kind of the, the deal maker wasn't right. able to close that deal. So uh, there is a frustration that he didn't go out there and use the bully pulpit to the extent that he can, and that he hasn't really figured out a way yet to incentivize these lawmakers to. We well, must hear that too, Ron. I mean, you said uh, or seemed to kind of uh, side with the president over the majority leader in your initial comments, but you must hear that, right, from people you know on Capitol Hill. I mean, uh, what happens here? Same thing uh, that Caitlin said. I'm hearing all the time. You have a lot of moderate members who are very upset that the president didn't come out and say, "Here are my principles for reform. Get me a piece of legislation, but it has to have the following components." I think this is normal for a White House. Certainly, our first six months in office it was very difficult for President Bush. And Bush how do you right. work for Bush, yes, for Bush 43? How do you work with the Congress? And I think with a new, experienced White House chief of staff and a better streamlined operation, I think this president and this White House will deliver. But they have to because these Republicans are running well, how, scared. How? How? I mean, how does the math work on delivering? Does anybody want to weigh in on that? Because it's one thing to have a debate about whether or not we can get 60 votes in the Senate for something that one party supports, but now getting to 50, especially if this is the type of rhetoric you have. Between between a majority leader and a president. How do you get there? Well, a couple, Any different, ideas? A couple different reasons this, this is happening. You only have two really uh, vulnerable Republicans up for your election next year. I and, know. Uh, so there isn't that pressure. And I've also talked to Republicans who say, we aren't putting enough pressure on the Democrats who are in these tough races That's next right. year. You see no uh, Democrats cross over the aisle for major pieces of legislation, which is also really telling. They're saying that they have no political incentive to work with this president, which means that there is you know, little 
margin of error. No, you're right, and that's interesting. We're going to talk a little bit more about that later because when you look at the numbers, it's not a foregone conclusion that the Republicans suddenly lose the Senate or right. even the House, right. even if they're politically unpopular, and it's really right. about math. What about from the president's point of view, Madison? How do you think he handles this? Obviously, he has other things to deal with right now. At the top of the list, got to be North Korea. So how do you deal with congressional Republicans that don't seem to be in lockstep with what you're dealing with, and you have this other much larger than distraction that's also on your table. Right. President Trump has many serious issues to deal with, but what I think is very disappointing for the White House is that these congressmen feel that they need to be incentivized to do what the people want. These people are hurting. These people need reform on both sides of the aisle. This shouldn't be something that's just for Republicans or just for Democrats. Everybody needs help, especially in places like the Midwest, where I'm from. Mm -hmm. And so for them to come forward and say, oh, well, the president hasn't done enough to push us. No, they should be doing this regardless. The White House is pushing back more or seems more worked up about their own quote unquote colleagues, right, than the Democrats sometimes, at least over the last week or so. Do you find that strange? Or? No, I mean, I understand their frustration completely, but I think there should be frustration on both sides coming from the people across this country that have been hurt by, by this, you know, yeah. disastrous Obamacare. What about you, Ron? That idea, this infighting, I mean, it can't be healthy 100% for the party, right? I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's terrible, it's destructive. A lot of the members of Congress that I've been speaking with in the last couple of weeks say that we need to get our collective act together. If we're going to yeah, fight, we and we're gonna that, be, if we're going to sit in the circular firing squad, why should the American people give us the trust and give us the opportunity to lead? And one other thing I would add is that... What's the answer to that, by the way? Well, the answer to that is Donald Trump is our president. He's a Republican, and Republicans need to find a way to deliver on the promises that they made to work with this president, to put legislation on his desk, and find a way to get those things signed. Okay, that's a key point. Donald Trump Trump is our president, Ron speaking as a Republican. He's worked for Republicans many times in the past. I wonder if that's part of it, that uh, many of these, I don't know, I don't want to speak for Mitch McConnell, but that many of these Republicans, you find that when you speak to, don't see this president as certainly a traditional Republican or one of them, right? Right. right. I mean, we know that a few members of Congress supported this president actively and kind of came around to it at the end. Yeah, I because think he was going to win or he's going to be nominated. Exactly. And they had a, a, an agenda binding them together. I think, you know, I've had conversations uh, with Republicans inside and outside of Washington, and you you definitely see this contrast between state party chairs, for example, who are right. very supportive of this president and think that he is helping them, uh, helping them cultivate candidates. I think when you look at races in 2018, there's going to be a difference between how incumbents run, incumbent Republicans, and how challengers to Democrats run. Talk to some of these challengers who are running uh, right side by side with Donald Trump, thinking that that will be uh, kind of using that pox on both your houses. Let's change up Washington. So I think that dynamic will be interesting. Think they to keep see. the house. They keep control. By the way, I mean, I, know I think it's, it's early, difficult. It's an uphill battle for Democrats to take the House, is. just given how these lines are drawn. Yep. And just because you're a Republican who doesn't like Trump does not necessarily mean you're going to flip for a Democrat. Like I said, we're going to talk about it later. But what do you think, Madison? Keep you know, the House? I or? think they will keep so. the House, and I think that'll be a result of the changes we're seeing in the state level. Mm -hmm. Places, like I said, where I'm from, Ohio, we have a new state chair, Jane Temkin. She's doing sure. an amazing job working with the president and hopefully putting out West candidates. West Virginia governor yeah. changing parties, things like that. Ron, that's the final word then on keeping the House and the Senate. Are you confident? in the Republicans? Very or? confident. I think we oh. keep the House handily, and I think we even actually pick up five seats in the Senate. Hmm. That's interesting. Um, it just shows you conventional wisdom is not always right on these things when you start running the math. Well, like I said, we're going to talk more about it later. But uh, thanks, guys. Appreciate it. All Good three of you. you.